The 67th mass shooting in America. I mean, the fact that this has been going on for three hours now and I have to constantly call my mom every 20 minutes to hear crying, hoping I'm okay. It's not okay, it shouldn't happen. Michigan State University becomes the site of yet another mass shooting in the U.S. Details on the shooter, the victims in critical condition, and the investigation. Plus, I don't want to have an iPhone after I graduate. My anxiety has definitely gone away. It probably does have something to do with social media and phones, but also like growing up. Our prime focus tonight takes you inside the classrooms of one school leading the charge against smartphones, showing the impact of a phoneless life and how that's playing out for teens fighting anxiety, depression, and more, begging the question, is a phoneless world the answer? And I think the key to a successful marriage is the right amount of space. You have to be your own person outside of it. The secrets of a successful relationship for would-be happy couples from happy couples to ring in this Valentine's Day. I got her. <laughs> He sure did. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone, and good evening. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following all that and more, including the investigation underway in Ohio after a train derailment led to massive fires and billowing smoke. As we learn, even more toxic chemicals were involved than previously known, what the EPA is now saying. Plus, the California senator bowing out of politics after a several decades-long career and also the former Trump confidant who's throwing her hat into the 2024 presidential race, and why at least two federal agencies are now warning that public scams against people on this Valentine's Day, who's being targeted and why, coming up. Our reporters are fanned out covering those stories and much more tonight, but we do begin just 45 days into 2023, only halfway through February, and already we've had 67 mass shootings in this country. Tonight, the Michigan State community is grieving after a gunman opened fire on campus late last night, killing at least three students and leaving five more seriously injured. After an hours-long manhunt, authorities found the 43-year-old suspect dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound and a shell-shocked campus woke up this morning with familiar calls for change from the president and some elected officials. But on this Tuesday, five years to the day since a gunman killed 17 students at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, there remains little hope of any significant gun reform. Tonight, we remember those students who lost their lives that day as we learn the names of the three students who died last night. Junior Ariel Diamond Anderson, she was studying to become a doctor. Sophomore Brian Frazier was the president of a fraternity on campus. And junior Alexandria Verner called a tremendous student athlete and leader. Alex Perez leads us off tonight from East Lansing, Michigan. That gunman's rampage unleashing horror and chaos on the campus of Michigan State University. Run! Tonight, we're learning more about the three MSU students killed, junior Ariel Diamond Anderson, sophomore Brian Frazier, and junior Alexandria Werner. The first 911 calls at 8.18 p.m. for shots fired inside Berkey Hall on campus. I have an active shooter at 509 East Circle Drive at Berkey Hall in MSU's campus. Authorities identifying the gunman as 43-year-old Anthony Dwayne McRae. They say he died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound after an intense, hours-long manhunt. Student Dominic Malaki was inside the building when McRae walked in. I heard the gunshot. It, it must have been right outside of the door um, because my ears were ringing from it. Um, but then, yeah, once, once I booked it to the far corner and, like, got down, that's when he came in our class shot four more times. I thankfully didn't see anything. Those few seconds, how frightening that is. I mean, you, your heart must drop. Yeah, that was the most horrifying thing I've uh, ever been a part of. Um, yeah, it was just terrifying, and then also it did not feel real. Police say two of the victims were shot dead inside that building before the suspect moved to the nearby student union, where authorities say he killed a third student. Those three victims, Frazier, a sophomore who was president of his fraternity, Werner, described as an athlete who exemplified kindness, and Anderson, whose family says she loved children and wanted to be a pediatrician. You want to talk about a little angel? Her name is Ariel. She helps everybody, anybody, at any time. Five other students shot, hospitalized in critical condition tonight. Overnight, students barricading themselves inside the library with tables and chairs. And then we moved this shelf to cover the window. Some watching through the window in fear. Oh my God. 
as so many ran for cover. I'm jumping down flights of stairs. Everyone's freaked out. Everyone's terrified. And I, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's truly a lot. After police released these surveillance images showing McCray wearing these distinctive red shoes, they were able to act on a tip within minutes. McCray found in Lansing, taking his own life as police moved in. They say he had two firearms and multiple magazines in a backpack. Law enforcement swarming the suspect's home where he lived with his father, who is cooperating with investigators. The FBI saying McRae suffered from mental health issues, noting they found a three-page document on him that listed a number of additional locations in Michigan, Colorado, and New Jersey that he also wanted to attack. And tonight, on the anniversary of the Parkland massacre, President Biden repeating his call to ban assault weapons after this, the 67th mass shooting this year. It's happening far too often in this country. Far too often. While we gather more information, there's one thing we do know to be true. We have to do something to stop gun violence ripping apart our communities. A regular sentiment that we hear more and more these days. Alex Perez joins us now. And Alex, do authorities have any sense of a motive here? Well, Lizzie, an exact motive is still under investigation, but authorities describe the gunman as a loner who they say was apparently targeting locations he believed had somehow hurt him. The campus here will be closed until Thursday. Lindsay? Alex Perez for us. Thanks so much, Alex. Next tonight to the aftermath of that train derailment in Ohio and the serious questions about the threat to residents after toxic chemicals spilled. It happened in East Palestine, Ohio, which is about an hour outside of Pittsburgh. Tonight, Ohio's governor is calling on Congress to take action, saying today it is absurd. The train which derailed February 3rd was not classified as highly hazardous material. Residents in the area were not evacuated until three days after the derailment. For more, let's bring in ABC's Alex Perche. He's live in Columbiana, which is the next town over from where this all happened. And Alex, I understand that you and the crew decided to move because you were starting to feel the material in the air. Bottom line, is it safe for residents who live near uh, this area where the derailment happened? Well, Lindsay, let's be clear. I mean, if you look at any of the gas monitors that they have posted on uh, buildings, on stop signs all around town, they will tell you that the air levels are good. Zeros across the board for readings for many of these toxic chemicals that uh, were released into the air during that controlled release. But as you mentioned, I mean, we were on the ground for it was probably about 45 minutes and and uh, our, everybody in our crew felt it in the air. You could smell it. Now, what it actually is, I can't tell you, but certainly it was one of those things where uh, whether it be uh, a, a little bit of a headache or, or, or um, you know, uh, laboring to, to, to breathe, if we'd stayed out there longer, yeah, there would be some issues. And that's something that a lot of these evacuees, people that are uh, still staying in hotels outside of town, tell us, uh, you know, those are the issues that they're dealing with. And Alex, there's certainly a lot of distrust in the community. Uh, the EPA and now the governor have basically said that things are safe for people. But, but what are you hearing from residents who are on the ground? Well, Lindsay, and, and again, they've heard that messaging that things are safe, the air, that the water is good to go. But because you hear anecdotal evidence of, of your neighbor down the street that's having a hard time breathing or your child. We talked to a woman today who said that she had just withdrawn uh, two of her kids from the local school because they're complaining of having headaches. And that's something that's new. Uh, people are listening to, to, their, to their bodies here. And, and actually, I got a chance to speak with this woman. Uh, uh, earlier today. Take a listen what she said. You haven't gone back inside your house since then. Um, I've went in to try to air out. Um, I'm afraid to remove anything just because I don't know cross-contamination, uh, what chemicals are actually in there. Yeah, and so Ashley McCollum was saying, you know, listen, this is her home. She wants to be back in this community, but because she's been listening to her kids that uh, have complained of having headaches and, and, and a hard time breathing because any time that she's back uh, in her neighborhood, which was right in the middle of that evacuation zone, she starts to kind of feel it uh, in the air. Because of that, she's going to stay away, and, and, and we're, we're hearing a lot of that. Yeah, you have to listen to your body, as you said there, Alice. So what happens next? I mean, what is the governor saying about lawsuits? 
Well, so uh, Governor DeWine has has flatly called out Norfolk Southern on this and said that this is this this is their problem. They're going to have to fix this. Uh, and and look, we've already heard from residents in this community that have been in conversations with lawyers, uh, and and that is going to be the next phase of this. But I also think, and you brought this up in in the intro, uh, as this investigation continues, that. Uh, that notion that this train with vinyl chloride was not classified as a high hazardous train and therefore the state wasn't notified as it was making its way through, that's going to be something that's also examined uh, and we might see some some movement on the front of, you know, how, uh, what kind of safety measures for, for, for train operators uh, through the states, uh, um, if that changes in, in, in the, coming, uh, the coming months. Alex Brochet, we hope certainly that you and the crew stay safe out there. We thank you so much for your reporting. Now to the dramatic new audio from the fighter pilot tracking one of those unidentified objects flying over Lake Huron this weekend. It comes as we've also learned the first missile fired at the object missed the target before a second missile brought it down. And the White House now says the intelligence community has a leading explanation about what these objects may be. ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raddatz has the details. Tonight, dramatic cockpit audio from F-16 fighter pilots tracking that as yet unidentified flying object over Michigan's Lake Huron on Sunday. The size of it, it's just so slow and so small and can't see it. In the audio recording verified by the Air Force, the Air National Guard pilots whizzing past the object, trying to avoid a collision and struggling to describe their target. So I'm going to call it like a container. I can't really tell, though, what the shape is. Definitely smaller than a car. Sometime later, the fighter jets launched a half a million dollar missile at the object and missed. And in this case, the missiles uh, land, or the missile uh, landed harmlessly in the water of Lake Huron. Uh, we, so, we tracked it all the way down. A second missile hit the object. The wreckage remains at the bottom of Lake Huron. The two other objects shot down over the last five days in Alaska and Canada have also yet to be retrieved. But today, the White House saying the intelligence community's leading explanation is that the objects could just be balloons tied to some commercial or benign purpose. They are considering or looking this at this to be uh, potentially benign. But of course, we want to make sure that uh, we uh, get the objects so we can get a sense of what uh, what uh, what the objects were for certain. The kind of explanation that did not sit well with some on Capitol Hill after a closed door briefing. On the one hand, the administration is saying we don't yet know what these last three objects are. But on the other hand, it wasn't a threat. Both of those things can't be true. The American people need and deserve to know more. Martha Raddatz joins us now. And Martha, we know that NORAD adjusted their radars to track smaller objects. Are we just going to keep seeing more of these shoot downs? So a senior U.S. official, Lindsay, tells us that there is now a working group, a so-called Tiger team, that's trying to figure out the right way to recalibrate the systems to register threats like the Chinese spy balloon while weeding out weather balloons and the like, or we're going to have a whole lot of missiles flying around, Lindsay. And the Chinese are also saying that the U.S. has sent spy balloons over China. How's the White House responding to that? The White House insists we have no balloon programs, although, frankly, they don't deny that we're spying on China with other means. Lindsay. All right. Martha Raddatz for us. Thanks so much, Martha. A new candidate has thrown their name into the hat, into the ring for the 2024 presidential election. Nikki Haley announced that she is running for the Republican nomination. The former governor of South Carolina is calling for generational change, a direct shot at former President Donald Trump. She was ambassador to the U.N. while Trump was in office. Here's our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott. Tonight, former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley announcing her campaign for the White House, introducing herself as the proud daughter of Indian immigrants, a first-generation American ready to take on the world. China and Russia are on the march. They all think we can be bullied, kicked around. You should know this about me. I don't put up with bullies. And when you kick back, it hurts them more if you're wearing heels. I'm Nikki Haley, and I'm running for president. Haley, the first woman and first person of color elected governor of South Carolina, and later Donald Trump's ambassador to the U.N. 
She's done a fantastic job. Shortly after the January 6th attack on the Capitol, Haley said Trump was, quote, going to find himself further and further isolated. He's lost any sort of political viability. But just a few months later, she made this pledge. I would not run if President Trump ran. Today, Haley did not mention the 76-year-old Trump by name, but she did say this. Republicans have lost the popular vote in seven out of the last eight presidential elections. That has to change. It's time for a new generation of leadership. Rachel Scott in the house. She joins us now. So we just heard Nikki Haley talking about that message that Republicans lost the popular vote seven of the last eight presidential elections. How is that message being received? Well, listen, it's something that we're starting to hear from a number of people that are considering possibly running against former President Donald Trump for that Republican nomination. But she was very clear today. She's sending a very stark message that the Republican Party needs to do something different, that there needs to be change. And as for former President Donald Trump, we also heard his reaction late today. He points out that Nikki Haley once said that she would never run against him, and now he is wishing her good luck. All right, so longtime Senator Dianne Feinstein, there's word that she's retiring. Is she, isn't she? I mean, it sounds like in the end she is retiring. In the end, she says this is the right time. She says there's a time for everything under the sun. She's making this decision now to resign, to sort of step down after her term is done. 89 years old, over half a century in politics, like 30 years of that was in the Senate. Her impact noted today by the president, by Democratic senators as well. And of course, we will start to see a lot of Democrats start announcing their run to replace her. I imagine so. All right, Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. Great to have you here in studio with us. And now we head overseas to Turkey and Syria. Some light amid all the darkness as miracle recoveries continue nearly 200 hours after the earthquake. This is the leader of Turkey is facing accusations of corruption. James Longman is in Turkey for us tonight. Tonight, the astonishing rescue in Turkey. Two brothers trapped for nearly 200 hours, 17-year-old Mohammed and later his older brother Baki. And tonight, with Turkish officials issuing more than 130 arrest warrants for contractors and developers who are accused of shoddy construction, President Erdogan is also under fire, critics pointing to videos like this. <laughs> Erdogan praising legislation pushed by his own political party that forgave construction violations without forcing property owners to bring their buildings up to code, saying it, quote, solved the problems of hundreds of thousands of property owners. And experts say Turkish authorities also failed to enforce building codes on new construction. Tonight, the death toll from that 7.8 magnitude quake topping 41,000 across Turkey and Syria. What was a rescue operation has now turned into a humanitarian crisis. All across this country, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands are living in camps like these. And many of them are Syrian. Marwan escaped the war in Syria eight years ago to start a new life in Turkey. But now the little he had is gone. His home destroyed, an aunt killed right in front of him. This tent is all he has now. He shares it with six other family members, including his little nephews. <laughs> He's four years old. And are these guys, they're living here? Yeah. This is a community that has learned survival the hard way, but Marwan somehow hasn't lost hope. James Longman joins us now. James, has Erdogan responded to the accusations against him and his responsibility in this tragedy? Well, actually, yes, Lindsay, there has late today been a response from President Erdogan. He's claimed that something like 90 percent, more than 90 percent of the buildings that collapsed were built before the 1999 law that came in after the previous earthquake, which required uh, contractors to build buildings to a certain code, to have them earthquake proof, essentially. That claim is, uh, I think a lot of people might call it demonstrably untrue. A lot of buildings that went down were built well after that. Interestingly, also, he hasn't said anything anything about the, the central claim, which is that he provided an amnesty to all contractors who were building in order to, uh, to fuel a construction boom. Very keen on construction here in Turkey to fuel the economy. And the allegation is that he gave an amnesty to all the, all the contractors that, that meant that they didn't even have to retrofit this earthquake proofing. So uh, he is under quite some pressure now. And he's, after two decades in power, he's facing uh, re-election in the spring. I think it's fair to say that is going to be a tough battle. Lindsay? It sounds that way. All right, James Longman for us. Thanks so much, James.
Back here in New York, the alleged driver of a U-Haul that ran down pedestrians in Brooklyn and killed one has officially been charged with murder and multiple accounts of attempted murder. According to police, the 62-year-old driver was off of his medication and suffered a mental health crisis. They also said that when he was taken into custody, he told the officers, quote, you should have shot me. The FBI has opened an investigation into allegations of federal rights violations following multiple deaths of inmates at the Harris County Jail in Texas after a request by the sheriff's office. According to county records, 21 inmates died in custody in 2021, and according to attorneys, last year at least 28 inmates lost their lives in Harris County Jail. A press release claims that the total number of deaths in 2023 is at least four. ABC News reached out to the Harris County Sheriff's Office and has not yet received a response. Still much more ahead to get to tonight coming up. Another rise in inflation numbers. Why President Biden is saying this is actually good news. But next, how one mother is fighting against social media companies following her son's loss. And our prime focus of the night, student life without smartphones. It's an experiment that one school is trying, but it could be the key to a healthier student body. They were living their lives through their phones instead of living their lives face to face with each other. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. With a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners. And the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. He may not look like central casting for a movie star hero, but what he did and how he risked it all to save hundreds of lives from terror are what heroes are made of. Really? That guy? What's the life and death truth behind what he did? Truth and Lies, The Informant. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I woke to the complete shock and horror that Carson had hung himself in our garage while we slept. In the weeks that followed, we learned that Carson had been viciously cyberbullied by his Snapchat friends, his high school classmates who were using the anonymous apps YOLO and LMK on Snapchat to hide their identities. That was Kristen Bride, who banded together with other mothers and testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee at a hearing about protecting children online. She'll be joining us on her horrific experience, her son's loss, and what can be done to prevent future deaths in just a moment. But first, we want to bring you a story that centers on a possible solution, a school that's taking their students and staff off their smartphones and helping them to stay present, begging the question, is a phoneless future in any way the solution? At times, I'm just like, why is everyone on their phones and not like having conversations? I want to go outside more and like just like walk around and just like be in nature instead of like on my phone. I started teaching at Buxton in, in 2013. We are a progressive boarding school. It's not like a kids these days story, it's about smartphones and how all of us interact with smartphones, myself included. When we made this change, it was for all of us. We thought it could be beneficial for everybody, and, and it really has been. I'm actually going to be heading this way. We told them about a year ago, everyone knew they were coming back this fall without it. When COVID hit, we could see how dependent kids had gotten on these devices. They were living their lives through their phones instead of living their lives face to face with each other. Last fall, we had a couple of kids who were um, fighting. Another kid was filming this fight between two kids, and it was being live streamed to one of the dorms on campus. 
it felt totally appropriate to many of our students to just have this experience mediated through a phone and to not feel any accountability. We still have the internet, we still have computers, people can still have social media. It's just not in your pocket all the time, everywhere you're going. It's definitely a hard adjustment, especially when we'll like go to town, like I'll get my iced chai. Everybody's like standing on their phones in line. I'm just like standing there twiddling my thumbs. So I had to like adjust when I had nothing else to do. I definitely think it's been a positive change and I feel like I've like gotten to take in a lot more of my senior year, which I really appreciate. Oh no, my tooth Oh no. My anxiety has definitely gone away. It probably does have something to do with social media and phones, but also like growing up and changing. Lots of fun. I'm a big fan. For me, it was perfect. And I definitely feel like I'm much happier um, and more productive. I don't want to have an iPhone after I graduate. Socially, I've become a lot more well-adjusted. And I definitely think that my light phone has played a, a part in that. I've just become more sure of myself. I don't feel the same anxiety about texting people that I used to. When they announced it, I was like very upset because Buxton is supposed to be like a very student-led experience. Most of my life was online. And then when they announced it, they were like, hey, you guys don't get a decision in this. I was really upset that they would like make such a big decision without asking anyone. Although I've been all right. I've been a lot less connected with friends that aren't at Buxton, which I'm sad about because I love them all very much but it's like, all right, it's not as bad as I expected. I have like a flip phone because I really wanted a phone with a camera on it. And at times I'm just like, why is everyone on their phones and not like having conversations? I want to go outside more and like, just like walk around and just like be in nature instead of like on my phone. I was like always making TikToks and taking pictures of everything, and now I'm just kind of like just living. Yeah, I feel like all that social media pressure that everybody had is like now gone. Whenever like I'm talking to family or friends, like it just goes a lot more smoothly. <laughs> I just find talking to people so much more interesting now. It's made me a lot more mature and think a lot about the people's feelings. So I feel like without social media, like my like sympathy and like connection towards other people has gotten a lot stronger. If we could all begin to see that taking these devices out of kids' lives for at least some part of their day is actually a form of respect for their development and a form of respect for how creative they can be, how engaged they can be, how thoughtful they are. Give these students back this period of their lives where they get to really figure out who they want to be in this world what they stand for and what matters to them. And I want to be able to take all that static and noise out of there so they have the time to really do that for themselves. A really unique perspective there, a chance for kids to be more present. Joining us now is Kristen Bride, social media reform advocate and mother of Carson Bride, who died by suicide at just 16 after being bullied by classmates. Kristen, we thank you so much for joining us. And of course, it goes without saying just how sorry we are for your loss. I'm curious if you got a chance to hear that story, if you think that a school environment like the one in the piece that we just aired, would that have made a difference for Carson? I think absolutely. Um, it would give him the experience of relating to people, his peers, more than relying on social media, number of likes and followers. And um, I, I'm just very impressed with what I see this school doing, and I hope more schools do it. And this is the cultural shift that we want to see. To be clear, Carson was um, cyber bullied during the pandemic when he was home and they were relying on phones mm. for, their, for their communication. So even though the phones are taken away during the day, it still comes into your home at night 
and um, kids are st still susceptible to it, to the harms that can happen. Uh, fair points there. Uh, you're also a member of the Bipartisan Council for Responsible Social Media, and you very much put the, the direct blame on social media apps for your son's death and, and the abuses that other kids face. I want to play another portion of your testimony at the hearing. Let us be clear. These are not coincidences, accidents, or unforeseen consequences. They are the direct result of products designed to hook and monetize America's children. It should not take grieving parents filing lawsuits to hold this industry accountable for their dangerous and addictive product designs. How does the business goal of monetization uh, with the bullying and, and abusive culture that Carson experienced, how do those two merge together? Well, the business model is one of engagement. The more that kids are looking at screens, the more these companies are, are profiting from advertising dollars. And in Carson's case, it was anonymous apps that were on the back end of Snapchat, YOLO and LMK. And what better way to engage kids but to allow them to say whatever they want publicly with no accountability. Mm. And that is part of the engagement model and the profit model. You're pushing for the Kids Online Safety Act. How could this law protect kids from the internet, which is mostly unregulated? The um, Kids Online Safety Act does many things, um, but from a parent's perspective, it first requires that these companies have a duty of care when they're creating and designing these products before they release them to millions of teens. The other thing it would do is create a communication channel between parents and the companies and, and kids that are reporting harms online. Currently, I am contacted by parents just about every month that are encountering horrific situations with false and vicious rumors and lies. It's virtually impossible for parents to keep up. You know, of course, parents have a role. They need to talk to their kids about guidelines, make sure that they know what they have on their phone for apps, who they're talking to. But really, the accountability needs to go back to the source, and that's the social media companies and the products that they're putting out there that are not safe for our kids, like anonymous apps. Before we let you go, tell us a little bit about Carson, what he was like, what you'd like all of us to know about him. Carson, I said in the hearing that he had blue eyes, but let me clarify, he would argue that he had hazel eyes and they were blue sometimes and they were green other times. Great sense of humor, amazing smile. And he would give me a hug that would lift me off the floor. Mm. And we miss him incredibly. I can imagine. Kristen Bride, we thank you so much for your time and sharing your story. And we want our viewers to know if you or someone you know is struggling with thoughts of suicide, free confidential help is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Just call or text the National Lifeline at 988. Even if you might feel like it, you are not alone. Still much more ahead to get to. Coming up, four Americans are charged in the assassination of a Caribbean leader. What officials say they were hoping to get from the new regime. But next, love is in the air and con artists are taking advantage. We take a look at the rise in romance scams by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic, We're baby. making magic.
America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Reporting from Ukraine on the biggest war in Europe since World War II. I'm Tom Stupy Burridge. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. It is, of course, Valentine's Day, but a new warning from the Federal Trade Commission about romance scams may be spoiling the holiday for some. Let's take a look by the numbers. The FTC says that romance scammers stole $1.3 billion last year, and their data reveals that top lies as scammers told to nearly 70,000 Americans to fleece their targets. Topping the list, according to the FTC, 24% of reports on scammers claim that they needed money because, quote, I or someone close to me is sick, hurt, or in jail. Three different lies came in at 18% of scammers' top lines, including, I can teach you how to invest, I'm in the military far away, and I need help with an important delivery. And rounding out the top five lies, 12% of scammers boldly said, we've never met, but let's talk about marriage. Another surprisingly frequent lie, 6% of scammers claimed they're on an oil rig or a ship and in need of help, and 3% fell victim to so-called sextortion when a romance scammer convinces their target to share explicit Explicit photos and then threatens to share them. Consumers between 18 to 29 were six times more likely to report that type of scam than older victims, but older Americans between 55 to 64 are also falling prey, losing nearly $139 million to romance scams on dating apps in 2020, according to a Homeland Security investigation. The median reported loss for all victims is about $4,400, according to the FTC, and that often comes through sending cryptocurrency, which romantic targets have reported losing more money on than any other method. So be careful out there and a reminder that the FTC warns that if anyone you've met online asks to send money, it's likely a scam. Much more ahead tonight here on Prime, the music superstar who was just tapped for one of the most coveted jobs in fashion. And as we celebrate Valentine's Day, some sage advice from six couples about how they keep the love alive. Compliment each other, dress for each other. He puts me first before himself. I think it's incredibly important to stay friends, even when we find ourselves in tough and difficult moments. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. 
My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. magic. It's like any other day. Our friends invited us to come see one of their kids playing this little league baseball game. And that was the last time I saw her. Anyone who abducts a child, you're probably twisted beyond untwisting. We have 8,300 leads in her case. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. People don't understand how you can keep fighting, but Morgan is worth fighting for. Morgan! Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. What are the secrets that most people don't know? Let me see your ID card. Wait, 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 wait. This is a world you will have to live in. There's no going back. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. A California man who used a stun gun on a Capitol Police officer during the January 6th riots has pled guilty to multiple felony charges. Daniel Rodriguez admitted in a taped interview with the FBI that he tased Officer Michael Fanone while the officer was trying to fight off rioters. Fanone suffered a heart attack from the assault and resigned from the force later that year. Rodriguez and another defendant charged with attacking Fanone were set to go to trial later this month. Rodriguez's sentencing is set for May 16th. In Florida, four men have been arrested for their alleged role in the 2021 assassination of Haiti's President Jovenel Moise. Assistant U.S. Attorney General Matt Olson said three of them operated businesses in South Florida and hoped to reap benefits from security and construction contracts granted by the government of Haiti. That includes the owner of a Miami area security company who officials say hired ex-Columbian soldiers for the mission. Communications between co-conspirators reveal a calculated plan that was intended to encourage civil unrest uh, as a cover for the assassin's entry into the president's residence to carry out a hit that resulted in his death. 11 defendants have now been charged in the U.S. in connection with the killing. Producers of the movie Rust say they will resume production this spring with safety officers on set and no working weapons or ammunition. Cinematographer Bianca Klein will take over for Helena Hutchins, who was killed on set when a live round fired by actor Alec Baldwin struck her. Klein says she'll donate the salary to charity in Hutchins' honor. The announcement comes weeks after officials announced plans to file manslaughter charges against Baldwin and the film's armorer, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. Rust Movie Productions also also said a documentary will be made on Hutchins' life and work with her husband, Matthew Hutchins, to serve as executive producer. Consumer prices are still high, but new data shows the pace of inflation is cooling. The Consumer Price Index for January shows inflation is at 6.4% compared to a year ago. That's down from the highs over the summer. President Biden reacting to the latest data. Today's report on inflation shows the good news is that inflation in America is continuing to come down. It's fallen seven straight months. There's more to go. There's still more work to do as we make this transition more steady, more stable growth. And there could be setbacks along the way. 
Luxury fashion house Louis Vuitton has named multi-talented producer, singer, songwriter, and philanthropist Pharrell Williams, the creative director of its menswear division. The Happy Singer is a 13-time Grammy winner and two-time Oscar nominee with experience working with luxury brands and designers like the late Karl Lagerfeld. Williams will be the first to take up the job at Louis Vuitton since acclaimed designer Virgil Abloh died in 2021 at 41 years old after a private cancer battle. Williams's first collection is scheduled to be shown during Paris Men's Fashion Week in June. The winner of the country's largest Powerball jackpot ever has finally come forward. The winning ticket was bought at a service station in Southern California last November. Now the California Lottery announcing the winner is a man named Edwin Castro who has decided not to speak publicly. Castro decided to take the money as one lump sum. A statement that was read, Castro said the real winner is California schools for money they get from lotto sales. Now to the lawsuit against a luxury hair care brand used by celebrities like Kim Kardashian. Some 30 customers are now suing the brand called Olaplex, alleging the product severely damaged their hair. ABC News' Ariel Reshef has the details. It is the hugely popular hair care line celebrities like Kim Kardashian have used themselves. But now Olaplex Holdings is being sued by nearly 30 consumers, claiming some of their products caused hair loss, hair damage and scalp injuries. The Olaplex brand, widely available in popular beauty stores and online, is marketed to restore damaged hair and protect against breakage. It doesn't matter if your hair has color, if it has chemicals, it's going to enhance what you have. But the lawsuit alleging the products did the opposite, causing allergic reactions, leaving some plaintiffs' hair dry, brittle, frizzy, and dull. One saying the treatments made her hair look like it had been cut with a weed whacker. They've purchased a product that's been marketed as something that repairs and restores hair, but has actually badly damaged their hair. I have never in my life experienced anything like this. And it's devastating. 44-year-old plaintiff Jessica Ariana says she used Olaplex for two months and lost 20% of her hair. I'm outside daily. I walk, run, etc. I started to feel the wind and air on my scalp in places that I've never felt it. Olaplex denying the allegations and defending the safety and efficacy of their products, telling ABC News in part, Olaplex products do not cause hair loss or hair breakage. Olaplex products are safe and effective, as millions of our customers can happily attest. We have publicly released test results from independent third-party laboratories to demonstrate this. Our thanks to Ariel. Tiger Woods is taking the next big step in his comeback by returning to the PGA Tour. He'll tee off in the Genesis Invitational on Thursday, his first official tournament since last July. It's the same tournament he was playing in when he crashed his SUV in February of 2021. He's still recovering from leg and ankle injuries, but said he wouldn't be playing if he didn't think he could win. The oldest functioning school in West Virginia got a much-needed financial boost from a lost trust fund found through an unclaimed property program. Our Ike Jachi has a story from Mannington, West Virginia. In a town like Mannington, West Virginia, surprises this big don't come often. Just over $1 million. It was you know, definitely overwhelming, and so it's been taking you know really most of the day to kind of um, get used to the idea. Mannington Middle School principal Melinda Brown knows it usually takes a little help. To think that you know, this has been there for so many years um, and that somebody's left their, their legacy to, to students. That help came in the form of an unclaimed property check worth more than $1 million to the Dr. Phoebe G. Moore Trust Fund, an endowment set up by Dr. Moore herself. Fulfilling the promise. West Virginia State Treasurer Riley Moore says his office has more than $300 million in unclaimed property. Our job is to get that money back to the citizens of West Virginia, the rightful owner or the next of kin. Unclaimed property includes several types of financial accounts, like unpaid insurance benefits, forgotten bank accounts, and even unused rebate cards. We sure appreciate it, and thank you a million. Moore's office contacted Phil Pritchard, the trust president, and let him know about the funds coming his way. At first, he was confused. We were kind of puzzled where it came from. What we found were there was these securities that were tied to this trust. It led us down this historic rabbit hole uh, trying to determine who 
uh, started this trust and who it belonged to, and that's how we discovered Dr. Moore. Phoebe Moore grew up on a farm just outside Mannington in the late 1800s. When West Virginia University decided to open its medical classes to women in 1898, Phoebe was one of the first women to sign up. The male students often bullied and embarrassed Phoebe and the women, forcing many to quit. But Phoebe was the only woman to finish, getting her MD in 1903, thanks to what some say was her tough farm upbringing. She was a country girl. That's 98-year-old Nasif Rohana, who met Dr. Moore after spraining his ankle as a teen. As long as they're going to help me, I don't care whether you're a boy or a girl. He was just one of the many people Dr. Moore helped in her 50 years serving Mannington and its surrounding communities. Among the many charitable gifts she gave throughout her career, she wanted to be remembered for her love of reading, establishing a trust designed to benefit the Mannington School Library. We can buy a lot more books that students will like other than just like picking through the ones that we have here. And where is she out of all she these graves? Right, right up here. here. Dr. Phoebe Moore passed away in 1953, but her legacy continues to help the people of Mannington, young and old. I'm glad that I lived long, <laughs> long enough to be able to say something nice for her. Our thanks to Ike for that. For more than five decades, singer Neil Diamond has captivated the world with his music, selling more than 130 million records worldwide, earning him some of the top honors in music, including a spot in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. With such a phenomenal career, there's only one way to tell his story as a musical. Broadway sensation Will Swenson is here to talk about his role in A Beautiful Noise, the Neil Diamond musical. Welcome, Will. How are you? I'm doing great, thanks. Hey, thank you so much for talking with us. So, okay, let's let's try to encapsulate this play. It's called a memory play. You do the highs and lows of Neil Diamond's life as a musician, as a husband, many other other aspects mm -hmm. of his life. But, but what is a memory play and how does it work with a musical? <laughs> it's cool. Our writer, Anthony McCartan, is a screenwriter and I think he had no preconceived ideas about how Broadway musicals normally work. So he kind of wrote this screenplay. And the idea is he starts with a modern day uh, Neil Diamond in his 80s in therapy. And he kind of doesn't want to talk about his life and it's being kind of a curmudgeon. And the way that the therapist gets him to break through is to go through his songs and sort of speak about his life through his lyrics and what was happening at the times that he wrote the songs and performed the songs. And he sort of flashes back and then I'm there to, to perform them as the younger version of Neil. So we kind of exist at the same time, on stage at the same time, and it's, it's an interesting uh, Combo. Marriage. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you were a fan of Neil Diamond yourself ahead of time. Yeah, yeah, I grew up on him. He's literally my dad's favorite singer of all time. And uh, so he was he was always being played in our house, so I knew his stuff very well. So what is it like to step in those iconic <laughs> shoes of his? <laughs> it's surreal. Was one of the craziest things I've ever done is the first time that Neil came to watch our rehearsals and I was playing Neil Diamond 10 feet away from Neil Diamond, trying to emulate his sound and be him and have him sitting right there was completely bizarre. What did he say? Any notes for you? I mean, not at first. At first he was just kind of, he said it was very strange for him to watch his life in front of him. Uh, but as we went through rehearsals, uh, he, he warmed up and, and uh, did have ideas and, and I was able to pick his brain and, and he was like, well, that's not really how that happened and I would say it this way. So he was very nurturing as we went along, yeah. How does the audience respond to it? <laughs> they love it. It's so great. I was joking with a friend the other day that it feels like cheating because people love Neil Diamond so much. They have such a nostalgia for his music and what it means to them that when we walk out on the first opening number, normally, in a Broadway show, you kind of have to prove yourself to the audience and they think, do I like this or not? The audience for our show loves Neil so much from the very beginning that we walk out and they're just screaming from the get-go. So it feels it feels a little bit like we're cheating. Do you play Sweet Caroline? Do we play Sweet I, Caroline? You got to, right? I, mean, I imagine the audience just sings that for you. They you do. We weren't sure out. how much they were going to sing along, and uh, we did our out of town in Boston. And the first night, we were like, oh, they're all going to sing the whole thing with us. So, yeah, we're aware of how much they're going to sing. audience member walks away, what do you hope that they take with them? Well, it's more moving than people anticipate, I think. I think everybody comes to the theater thinking they're going to have a good time and be, be able to remember those songs and have a nice kind of concerty evening. But but the the play is, is written so thoughtfully and from a very emotional standpoint that uh, 
that people often leave with tears running down their mm -hmm. face because it's 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 framed in a in a beautiful way and everybody's really moved by it. Do you think that a lot of people know Neil Diamond or or really more his his music and his persona? I don't know if they know his story mm -hmm. a, as much as they know his songs. I know people come to the show thinking I probably know three or four Neil Diamond songs and they leave saying, "Oh, I guess I know 20 Neil yeah. Diamond songs because he had so many so many hits." I think I'm going to have Sweet Caroline in my head the rest of the it's day. It's inescapable. <laughs> Will, thank you so much. I want to let our viewers know a beautiful noise. The Neil Diamond musical is performing at the Broadhurst Theater in New York City right now. Now to the secrets we all need. True love. We are celebrating Valentine's Day with advice from several couples who share their wisdom on how to keep a relationship strong. ABC News' Megan Wright has more. We met through a uh, mutual friend. We always wake up laughing. I love being around him. He just makes me feel good, builds me up, and he still gives me butterflies to this day. Love is in the air. So we wanted to know from these happy couples. Is there a secret on how you can have a successful relationship? Compliment each other. Dress for each other. He puts me first before himself. Communication is number one. You know, you should always be vocal about what you like and what you don't like so your partner can, you know, make sure to navigate the right way. She allows me to be myself. I think the key to a successful marriage is the right amount of space. Have hobbies that do not involve your wife. You have to be your own person outside of it. Every couple kind of hits that wall sometimes where you don't communicate well. And you just yeah. kind of have to take a few steps back and be like, all right, is this worth this argument? I think it's incredibly important to stay friends, even when we find ourselves in tough and difficult moments. For Anne and Lenny Saccone, married 70 years, it's the little things, like pushing in a chair, that helps keep their love strong. She's magnificent. Another 70 years, if I'm still here, you're still my heart and soul. That's right. God bless you. <laughs> we help each other. <laughs> it's really about two words, emotional connection. If you can feel safe with someone, if you can feel vulnerable with that person, everything else becomes great. Valentine's Day is amazing for couples, but then can sometimes be very triggering for people who are single. What is some advice for people who are single that have to navigate this holiday? What Valentine's Day should be about is it should be a day of appreciation for all the love you have in your life, whether it be romantic, whether it be platonic, and then it should be a reflection on, okay, what can I do now to become better in all of my relationships? <laughs> As for these couples, <laughs> I love this man. A happy Valentine's Day indeed. I got her. I'm going to keep her. Another 70 years more to that couple. Our thanks to Megan for that. And before we go tonight, we return back to our top story for our image of the day. This from Michigan State University. As a crowd gathered around what's affectionately known as The Rock, the oldest monument on campus. It's often painted in celebration of a big event, but now it's marked very differently after someone painted how many more. That is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Hour, the allegations at a Texas prison that are leading the FBI to investigate possible federal rights violations. And ABC's Juju Chang has the story behind why the Jonas Brothers say they had to break up. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is
is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. Reporting from Denver, I'm Mola Lenghi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Lindsay Davis, thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. The FBI has opened an investigation into allegations of federal rights violations following multiple deaths of inmates at the Harris County Jail in Texas after a request by the Sheriff's Office. According to county records, 21 inmates died in custody in 2021. And according to attorneys last year, at least 28 inmates lost their lives in Harris County Jail. A press release claims that the total number of deaths in 2023 is at least four. ABC News reached out to the Harris County Sheriff's Office and has not yet received a response. The alleged driver of a U-Haul that ran down pedestrians in Brooklyn and killed one has officially been charged with murder and multiple counts of attempted murder. According to police, the 62-year-old driver was off of his medication and suffering a mental health crisis. They also said that when he was taken into custody, he told the officers, quote, you should have shot me. And following the shooting death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins, production of the movie Rust is now scheduled to resume this spring. Alec Baldwin remains in the cast despite being charged with involuntary manslaughter for her death. Hutchins' husband has been hired as an executive producer. Two new safety officers were also added to the crew, and working weapons and all ammunition have been barred from the set. We are just 45 days into 2023, only halfway through February, and already we've had 67 mass shootings in this country. Tonight, the Michigan State community is grieving after a gunman opened fire on campus late last night, killing at least three students and leaving five more seriously injured. After an hours-long manhunt, authorities found the 43-year-old suspect dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Alex Perez reports from East Lansing, Michigan. That gunman's rampage unleashing Run! horror and chaos on the campus of Michigan State University. Tonight, we're learning more about the three MSU students killed, junior Ariel Diamond Anderson, sophomore Brian Frazier, and junior Alexandria Werner. The first 911 calls at 8.18 p.m. for shots fired inside Berkey Hall on campus. I have an active shooter at 509 East Circle Drive at Berkey Hall in MSU's campus. Authorities identifying the gunman as 43-year-old Anthony Dwayne McRae. They say he died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound after an intense hours-long manhunt. Student Dominic Malaki was inside the building when McRae walked in. I heard the gunshot. It, it must have been right outside of the door um, because my ears were ringing from it. Um, but then, yeah, once once I booked into the far corner and like got down, that's when he came in our class, shot four more times. I thankfully didn't see anything. Those few seconds, how frightening that is. I mean, you, your heart must drop. Yeah, that was the most horrifying thing I've uh, ever been a part of. Um, yeah, it was just terrifying, and then also it did not feel real. Police say two of the victims were shot dead inside that building before the suspect moved to the nearby student union, where authorities say he killed a third student. Those three victims, Frazier, a sophomore who was president of his fraternity, Werner, described as an athlete who exemplified kindness, and Anderson, whose family says she loved children and wanted to be a pediatrician. You want to talk about a little angel? Her name is Ariel. She helps everybody, anybody, at any time. Five other students shot, hospitalized in critical condition tonight. Overnight, students barricading themselves inside the library with tables and chairs. And then we moved the shelf to cover the window. Some watching through the window in fear. Oh my God. As so many ran for cover. 
I'm jumping down flights of stairs. Everyone's freaked out. Everyone's terrified. And I, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's truly a lot. After police released these surveillance images showing McRae wearing these distinctive red shoes, they were able to act on a tip within minutes. McRae found in Lansing, taking his own life as police moved in. They say he had two firearms and multiple magazines in a backpack. Law enforcement swarming the suspect's home where he lived with his father, who is cooperating with investigators. The FBI saying McRae suffered from mental health issues, noting they found a three-page document on him that listed a number of additional locations in Michigan, Colorado, and New Jersey that he also wanted to attack. And tonight, on the anniversary of the Parkland massacre, President Biden repeating his call to ban assault weapons after this, the 67th mass shooting this year. It's happening far too often in this country, far too often. While we gather more information, there's one thing we do know to be true. We have to do something to stop gun violence ripping apart our communities. Our thanks to Alex. Now to the dramatic new audio from the fighter pilot tracking one of those unidentified objects flying over Lake Huron this weekend. It comes as we've also learned the first missile fired at the object missed the target before a second missile ultimately brought it down. And the White House now says the intelligence community has a leading explanation about what these objects may be. ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raditz has the details. Tonight, dramatic cockpit audio from F-16 fighter pilots tracking that as yet unidentified flying object over Michigan's Lake Huron on Sunday. The size of it, it's just so slow and so small and can't see it. In the audio recording verified by the Air Force, the Air National Guard pilots whizzing past the object, trying to avoid a collision and struggling to describe their target. So I'm gonna call it like a container. Sometime later, the fighter jets launched a half a million dollar missile at the object and missed. And in this case, the missiles uh, land or the missile uh, landed harmlessly in the water of Lake Huron. Uh, we saw, we tracked it all the way down. A second missile hit the object. The wreckage remains at the bottom of Lake Huron. The two other objects shot down over the last five days in Alaska and Canada have also yet to be retrieved. But today, the White House saying the intelligence community's leading explanation is that the objects could just be balloons tied to some commercial or benign purpose. They are considering or looking this, at this to be uh, potentially benign. But of course, we want to make sure that uh, we uh, get the objects so we can get a sense of what uh, what uh, what the objects were for certain. The kind of explanation that did not sit well with some on Capitol Hill after a closed door briefing. On the one hand, the administration is saying we don't yet know what these last three objects are. But on the other hand, it wasn't a threat. Both of those things can't be true. The American people need and deserve to know more. Our thanks to Martha. A new candidate has thrown her name into the ring for the 2024 presidential election. Nikki Haley announced that she's running for the Republican nomination. The former governor of South Carolina is calling for generational change, a direct shot at former President Donald Trump. She was ambassador to UN while Trump was in office. Here's senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott. Tonight, former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley announcing her campaign for the White House, introducing herself as the proud daughter of Indian immigrants, a first-generation American ready to take on the world. China and Russia are on the march. They all think we can be bullied, kicked around. You should know this about me. I don't put up with bullies. And when you kick back, it hurts them more if you're wearing heels. I'm Nikki Haley, and I'm running for president. Haley, the first woman and first person of color elected governor of South Carolina, and later Donald Trump's ambassador to the UN. She's done a fantastic job. Shortly after the January 6th attack on the Capitol, Haley said Trump was, quote, going to find himself further and further isolated. He's lost any sort of political viability. But just a few months later, she made this pledge. I would not run if President Trump ran. Today, Haley did not mention the 76-year-old Trump by name, but she did say this. Republicans have lost the popular vote in seven out of the last eight presidential elections. That has to change. It's time for a new generation of leadership. 
Our thanks to Rachel. And now we head overseas to Turkey and Syria. Some light amid all the darkness as miracle recoveries continue nearly 200 hours after the earthquake. This is the leader of Turkey is facing accusations of corruption. James Longman is in Turkey for us tonight. Tonight, the astonishing rescue in Turkey. Two brothers trapped for nearly 200 hours, 17-year-old Mohammed and later his older brother Baki. And tonight, with Turkish officials issuing more than 130 arrest warrants for contractors and developers who are accused of shoddy construction, President Erdogan is also under fire, critics pointing to videos like this. <laughs> Erdogan praising legislation pushed by his own political party that forgave construction violations without forcing property owners to bring their buildings up to code, saying it, quote, solved the problems of hundreds of thousands of property owners. And experts say Turkish authorities also failed to enforce building codes on new construction. Tonight, the death toll from that 7.8 magnitude quake topping 41,000 across Turkey and Syria. What was a rescue operation has now turned into a humanitarian crisis. All across this country, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands are living in camps like these. And many of them are Syrian. Yeah. Marwan escaped the war in Syria eight years ago to start a new life in Turkey. But now the little he had is gone. His home destroyed, an aunt killed right in front of him. This tent is all he has now. He shares it with six other family members, including his little nephews. <laughs> Hello. Hello. How old are you? He's four years old. And are these guys, they're living here? Yeah. This is a community that has learned survival the hard way, but Marwan somehow hasn't lost hope. Still some hope there. Are thanks to James for that. For the first time, the sister of Alec Murdoch's wife testified about what happened on the day of the murders and about the Murdoch's marriage. Our Eva Pilgrim has the latest from the courtroom. Tonight, Maggie Murdoch's family breaking their silence. Her sister Marion taking the stand in the case against her brother-in-law, getting emotional as she recalled Alec Murdoch had asked his wife Maggie to come home from their beach house just hours before she was murdered. You encouraged her to go to Moza. I did. Was that the last time you talked to her? Yes. Prosecutors say that night, Alec Murdoch shot Maggie and his son Paul to death at close range on the family's estate. Maggie's sister remembers asking Alec if he thought they suffered. I did at one point ask him if Maggie suffered, and he assured me that she did not. Now, I don't know that I think that's true. Maggie's sister saying after the murder, she found it odd Alec was still preoccupied with clearing his son's name. Paul had been facing charges for a fatal boat crash. And I thought that was so strange because my number one goal was to find out who killed my sister and Paul. Did you ever act scared or afraid that the real, the real killers were out there somewhere? I think everybody was afraid. And Alec didn't seem to be afraid. But the defense team pressing Maggie's sister on the state of the Murdoch's marriage. Can you tell the jury what do you believe Alec's relationship with Maggie was? It was good. It wasn't perfect. Um, but Maggie was happy. So much intrigue with this case. Eva Pilgrim joins us now. Eva, what's next in the trial? Well, Lindsay, in the morning, we're expecting a hearing to determine if a roadside shooting incident involving Alec Murdoch will be admissible in this trial. The state has said they expect to wrap up their side of the case this week. The defense will then go. They have said previously that they have about a week and a half to lay out their case before all of this goes to the jury. Lindsay. All right, Eva Pilgrim, our thanks to you. Tonight, we are tracking two major storms moving across the country that could affect 125 million Americans in 30 states, from Nevada all the way to New York. And there are some real concerns about tornadoes. Let's get right to Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z. Hey, Ginger. 
Hey there, Lindsay. This map that I'm about to show you is so busy. I first want to point your eye towards kind of that brown and yellow color because that's almost across the whole map. Nevada, California, from Santa Barbara to Jamestown, New York, all the way through Michigan down to Louisiana. That represents wind. And we're not talking about wind associated with a thunderstorm. We're talking about wind that's just widespread. We've already seen it. Guymon, Oklahoma had a gust of 84. We've seen damage in the panhandle of Texas. What you're going to do is take that wind and now add snow closer to that low pressure system. And if you're in Denver or south to say Taos, you add a half a foot of snow and you have big time problems on the roads like I-25. That same low is going to slide across and by late afternoon, kick off of the evening, that cold front starts to instigate just enough twist in the atmosphere that you could see some supercells, those kind of individual thunderstorms that rotate, uh, turn into some tornadoes that go into the overnight. Damaging wind is possible too. Then Ohio down to Alabama as we go through Thursday. So that kind of starts in the overnight hours and just progresses east. Ahead of all of this, we could see more than 200 record high temperatures in the next couple of days. The numbers are going to be easily 20 to 25 degrees above average. You can feel it out here tonight. It is so mild, but we'll stay in the 60s through the end of the week here in New York City, Philadelphia, getting into the mid 60s. And if you were wondering, this is not normal, but the extended forecast for much of February looks really mild too, Lindsay. All right, Ginger, our thanks to you. Still much more ahead to get to coming up. They've grown up in front of the world performing to sold out crowds. Global superstars, the Jonas Brothers, talk about their new phase of life, family and brotherhood. The next new revelations as police try to figure out why a transgender teenage girl was killed, the possible motive in her death. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched most trusted and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Bring your friends. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day with a smile, Somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's Bring how you start your, your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is America's number one streaming news. ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. What are the secrets that most people don't know? Let me see your ID card. Wait, 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 wait. This is a world you will have to live in. There's no going back. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Today, British police said that they were investigating whether the murder of a transgender teenage girl in Northwest England over the weekend was a hate crime. Police arrested two teenagers on Saturday on suspicion of murder after the body of 16-year-old Brianna J Jai was found. Initially, they said that there was no evidence to suggest the circumstances around Jai's death were hate-related, but now they say that they were examining all possible motives for the murder. Families who lost their homes in the Chilean wildfires, which have destroyed more than a million acres, received temporary houses provided by the government. Meanwhile, Chile's police are conducting 50 investigations into the intense wave of forest fires that have recently hit the south central part of the country to determine whether the fires were started intentionally. The wildfires have killed 24 people and left more than 6,800 homeless. A Manila animal rights group opened up their shelter for guests who wished to spend Valentine's Day on a date with their chosen 
rescue animal. Visitors to the shelter could book a date with a furry companion. They picked for 10 to $20, mostly dogs and cats, and were given free time with their furry companions, as well as some snacks and refreshments. Those who fell in love with their chosen rescue animals were able, able to later opt for adoption. Their 2013 split shattered the hearts of fans everywhere. But now the Jonas Brothers say they had to break up in order to ultimately save the group. Our Juju Chang sat down with the global superstars about this new phase of life and brotherhood. You know, normal day, waiting for international rock stars to enter the car. Here they come. Let's do it. We're just going over our notes. Yeah. I see that. Getting just ready to... Just making sure we're aware of what we should say. Exactly. Four score and seven years ago. Four score and 15 years ago. Mm. 18 years ago. We're in the heart of Hollywood. Woo! And the Jonas Brothers are preparing to receive the recognition of a lifetime. People ask all the time, do you still get nervous? Like, I don't get nervous for shows, I don't get nervous for anything really, except for things like this. Like, make sure everyone's in, in their place. And... Yeah, you just want it to go right. Oh, yeah. The famous trio with me in tow are headed to Hollywood Boulevard, the Walk of Fame, to claim a star with their name on it. Last chance to, to back out, guys. After nearly 20 years in the business, Go to the staging area. this honor, yet more proof that the Jonas Brothers have already reached the pinnacle of success in their early 30s. Garnering acclaim and awards and stealing the hearts of fans around the globe. I'm gonna cry today. At least 12 times. <laughs> Really, you guys are way too young to be talking about, you know, oh, here's this crowning achievement of this, you know, star. You, you, you aren't sure if it's a good thing or bad thing when we got, when we got the text <laughs> saying, congrats, guys, you're going to get a star on the, on the Walk of Fame. We're like, oh, is it over? Does that mean we hang it up? But then you look at, like, the last couple of years, who have received these uh, incredible honors, and they're still kicking ass, so. And that's exactly what the brothers have been doing for two decades. Their catchy songs like Only Human... and Burning Up, sung by millions around the world. Hitting it big with collaborations like Leave Before You Love Me. Their faces splashed across major magazine covers along the way, which helped sell more than 20 million albums. Their newest one coming out May 5th. Let's go first verse. Let's do it. It's cool if I tell Joe, like, hey, verse one. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. he's going to be cool. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, if he's like, I really want to do verse two, then we do that. Cool. But, uh, you know what? Let's just get the whole top line all the way through. Put me in, coach. They've been recording their new tracks in New York City. I feel like that's definitely a Joe on the... OK, we'll mark that. He can full voice that. Got you. So maybe just let me come in on that. Fire hoping to bring a new sound to their fans. Can you grab me on top of the choir? You know, we're all parents now, which is a big difference to the last time we made an album, and, and obviously albums before that. And so I think, naturally, you know, there, there, are, there are themes that are, are relevant to kind of the, the moment we're in in our life. Um, sure. And that we, we hope you know, people can connect in their, their own way, too. Time's been a door frame with all we've gone through. Time is a door frame with all we've gone through. The things we go through. I'm solid. We're going to layer all that in. Cool. We got the goods. Good work. Ow, ow. Guys, we got the mix of our new song, Wings, and um, I, I don't care. I just want you to hear it. The album, something the brothers seem genuinely excited about. Now they're seeing their names imprinted on the most famous sidewalk in America. But they almost didn't make it here, at least not together. They are splitting up. Their fans shocked. Stunned at the bombshell news. And is it for good? 
They went through a reckoning with each other and themselves and spoke openly about what almost tore them apart in the Amazon Prime documentary, Chasing Happiness. The reality of, of it all was starting to hit me. We're all so frustrated and nothing is working. Like we hate each other, basically. I'm glad that, that that day we decided not to do this anymore, that we changed our minds to, together. <laughs> you might think, oh, we technically broke up once already. That would make it more fragile. But in fact, it's, it's the opposite. Break up to make up. Our thanks to Juju for that. For more on the Jonas Brothers, check out Impact by Nightline. The episode is streaming on Hulu right now. New episodes drop every Thursday. And still to come, a man paralyzed at 22 years old while snowboarding. How he gathered the courage to get back out there on the slopes and return to the spot where his life changed forever. It's like any other day. Our friends invited us to come see one of their kids play in this little league baseball game. And that was the last time I saw her. Anyone who abducts a child, you're probably twisted beyond untwisting. We have 8,300 leads in her case. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. People don't understand how you can keep fighting, but Morgan is worth fighting for. Morgan! So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. He may not look like central casting for a movie star hero, but what he did and how he risked it all to save hundreds of lives from terror are what heroes are made of. Really? That guy? What's the life and death truth behind what he did? Truth and Lies, The Informant. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Santa Fe, New Mexico, I'm Lindsay Davis. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Of course, there are a lot of different ways that you can be in love, and that might include being in love with life. This Valentine's Day, our Will Gans is spotlighting people who've said yes to the opportunities of life. And we begin with an athlete in Colorado who embraces the cold and all the fun that comes with it. Hey, Trevor! Woo! This oh, is Trevor oh, Kennison. Do you love your life? I love my life very much. <laughs> Full-time life lover and adaptive skier and lifelong winter athlete. You see nothing but white teeth. It was, he, he wouldn't even go inside to get something to eat. No, I gotta do it again, I gotta do it again. Seven years ago, Trevor broke two vertebrae in a snowboarding accident on a mountain in Colorado. Paralyzed at 22 years old, Trevor's life suddenly became unrecognizable. You know, it sucks what happened to me, but it's gonna be okay. Despite the pain, despite the prognosis, Trevor continued saying yes to life, eventually returning to the slopes on a sit ski, and now returning to the spot where he broke his back all those years ago. I wanted closure, and I took it to the highest extreme possible. Trevor deciding to attempt a double backflip on his sit ski, a feat never before accomplished, in the spot where he nearly died in 2014. It wasn't like I was mad at that spot. Without this spot, I wouldn't have the life I have. Now, Trevor soaring to unbelievable new heights. What has inspired you to continue building this big, bold, beautiful life? You know, the people around me and, you know, really realizing of, you know, what I have in front of me. You know, I, I could have died on the mountain, but I'm still here. And yeah, I don't have use of my legs and I can't walk. But at the same time, you know, I've done so many incredible things. What's even more exciting, Trevor has documented his journey back to that spot on the mountain and into the history books in a new film called Full Circle. It premiered overnight at the Santa Barbara Film Festival, but Trevor says he's more comfortable backflipping twice in a sit ski than he is on a red carpet, which to me doesn't make a ton of sense, Lindsay. But Trevor, quite the inspiration there, Will. Thank you. 
And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here with you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can also find us on Hulu, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. Happy Valentine's Day, but we will be right back. See one of their kids playing this little league baseball game. And that was the last time I 